and welcome to the ACR Bulletin Podcast, the show where we examine the latest trends affecting radiology. I'm your host, Chris Hobson, and today we'll be speaking with Philip Levy, MD, MPH. Dr. Levy is Professor of Emergency Medicine and Associate Vice President of Translational Science at Wayne State University in Michigan. He is also the developer and director of the Wayne State Mobile Unit Program. In addition to this, he is Chief Medical Officer of People.Health. Through his various roles, Dr. Levy and his team are working to overcome access to care barriers in underserved communities of Detroit by bringing mobile medical screening services, including mobile lung cancer screening units, to those in need. Dr. Levy, thank you so much for being here today. Chris, it's my pleasure to be here with you. Absolutely. Well, to start, let's please orient us, uh, our audience, to the area where you and your team cover. I always like to start there. So you're based out of Wayne State University, which is located in Detroit, Michigan. And I think most members of our audience will probably be at least somewhat familiar with the challenges Detroit has faced in recent decades. Um, But I was wondering if you can maybe build on that and give us maybe a fuller picture of the kind of resource limited areas your team services. Yeah, absolutely. So as you rightly corrected, Detroit uh, on some levels, unfortunately, is kind of a poster child for uh, urban environments with uh, socioeconomic uh, status challenges and uh, a lot of social vulnerability. And when the pandemic hit, we started to see disparities in uh, COVID-related outcomes for brown and black communities uh, in Southeast Michigan. Detroit itself is about 82% black uh, by... um, uh, you know, the census. Uh, and so it's a community that has a high uh, concentration of, of uh, minority individuals, although they're a majority in our city, with a lot of social vulnerability. And we realized that one of the reasons that that community was suffering so much from COVID is that they didn't have a lot of accessibility to healthcare resources uh, during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of communities didn't, right? It was difficult to get testing and, and you know, resume Uh, regular medical care because offices were closed and people couldn't get prescriptions, they couldn't get screenings and what have you. So we started working with the Ford Motor Company uh, to develop a program of mobile health outreach using transit vans that we could take into communities uh, with high social vulnerability bring COVID testing initially to those communities, and then start to bring in data on social vulnerability from an individual level, right? We can use the CDC data from social vulnerability, the social vulnerability index, which I think through the pandemic, a lot of us have become familiar with, to identify these high-risk communities, uh, target outreach to those communities, and then get information on an individual level about social needs, and then start to provide those social services through community health workers and navigators that we embedded in our mobile outreach program. Yeah, and I'm and so I'm I'm always so intrigued by the <clears throat> by the intersection of tech and and still people pe- people working it and and you you seem to have a good mix of that between the data analysis piece and the the mobile piece but also the nurse navigators and and uh, you know people on the ground so we'll get into that a little bit a little bit later but I'd also like to get to um you know again we'll get to your team's innovative mobile screening solutions in a minute but first uh, Dr Levy it'd be great to get a better understanding of of actually your background and I'm wondering uh, you know from what I've read it seems like you you are a, an ER doctor by training emergency room doctor uh, but you kind of left that particular line of work in recent years to develop kind of more innovative ways again what we'll talk about in a minute uh, to provide patients better access to preventable health care um, so I'm really really so intrigued by that so can you please tell us a little bit more about why you made that decision and kind of the new path that's led you down? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So as an emergency physician, I I trained at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. I was always indoctrinated on the concept that, yes, emergency departments are acute care centers where people in, you know, some of the most dire circumstances come, but many people also come because they have no other access to health care. And as as George Bush famously said many years ago when he was president, we we do have a universal coverage in the United States. It's called the emergency department. Mm. And so this idea that ERs fill a void Void uh, in healthcare ha- has been always with me. It's been in my my you know my core from my training. But when I, I moved from New York to Detroit, uh, I really focused initially on those acute conditions because that's what we you know that, that's what rises up most as ER docs, right? Can we save right. lives right now? And yes. and gravitated towards acute cardiovascular diseases uh, like heart attacks and acute heart failure and and those things, and started to you know pull in data for national registries that we participated in, uh, some randomized clinical trials. But what we started to notice was that the mean age of our population for things like heart failure was about 20 years younger than the national average. 
And we started to uh, delve into why was that? Well, it all traced back to uncontrolled hypertension, which we know is the most important population attributable risk factor for cardiovascular disease overall. And so I started this program of screening people uh, in the ER, initially looking at echoes to determine who's got subclinical ventricular remodeling and left ventricular hypertrophy amongst those with uncontrolled blood pressure. And then started designing intervention trials for that specific target population, right? Those with early structural abnormalities in their heart who have uncontrolled blood pressure, doing things like vitamin D supplementation, because there's data, you know, in, in, in particularly in black populations, vitamin D may be an important contributor to that risk with hypertension. But cut to the chase, what I found every time was all we needed to do was control blood pressure. Hmm. So we started to step back and say, well, what we really need to be doing is creating comprehensive programs to screen people for hypertension in the ER. We get a blood pressure on every patient who comes in the door, and then we make all of our treatment decisions about that individual using that information. And we said, instead of using it for the acute intervention for this person, what if we started to say, okay, for the sick people, we got to obviously take care of them, but for the rest, we could aggregate this data and start to get information about the community itself mm -hmm. and start to think about this concept of a community pressure load. In the, in the uh, infectious disease world, the HIV world, there's a concept of community viral load, which is how well is this condition managed? There's been a concept basically of population level blood pressure reductions that's been around for a while, but nobody's really developed this idea of community pressure load. We started to do that aggregating data, mapping it out, knowing not when people came to the ER, what the issue was, but in the community they lived. Mm. How bad is blood pressure control? How, how poor, uh, you know, is the management of this condition? And then started to say, well, if we really want to make a big difference down the road. I can wait for them to come to the ER, but how about I get out into the community? How about we start to say this information is really important for us to know where to go for the highest risks and, and target uh, interventions to, to let people, you know, be in their neighborhoods, but we bring resources to them to screen for hypertension, to, you know, get, get the care that they need once we identify problems. That's, and that's such a nice uh, segue into to the, my next question, which really builds on, on that, on, on that really nice foundation you just laid. Um, so I was wondering if we could like turn our talk now to the Wayne State Mobile Unit Program, uh, which served as kind of the predicate to what we'll get to in a minute, which is the lung cancer screening units that, that you're working uh, on rolling out later this year. Um, but, but if you could please provide a picture of, you know, what the mobile units look like um, and, and how, you know, although initially focused on, and, and you'll get to the fact that they were kind of, you know, came out during COVID-19 as very key uh, tool in, in that fight. But, you know, it's, it's sort of the program has kind of evolved since then to include, you know, and again, it's, it always, I think throughout it's always had the, the uh, through line of preventative health services provided to the, to the community. But can you talk about kind of that progression and, and what you call portable population health, which I think is such a great term? Oh, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. So while I was developing all of this conceptually, right, from the ER to take data, uh, we, we had started integrating this information in a geospatial analysis program called Phoenix, which I know we're going to get to in a little bit, the Population Health Outcome Information Exchange as a way to understand where risk exists in neighborhoods, what are the social factors that may contribute to those risks, and then what can we do if we go into communities to address these problems that we're seeing? COVID hit, we started working with the Ford Motor Company, uh, like I mentioned, but again, quickly realized that we were on to a new way to, to reach a population and deliver healthcare. We started to gain traction uh, with a lot of funding, initially philanthropy. Then the state of Michigan created a racial disparities task force and took their CARES Act dollars and invested in programs like the mobile unit um, program that we we started on uh, you know, uh, early in the pandemic. But we started again to realize that people weren't dying because COVID had a predilection for black or white populations, they were dying because the population in Detroit has such a longstanding history of uncontrolled risk factors like hypertension and diabetes. So the physiology upon which COVID was superimposed was already um, worse off than, than others. And so really the, the, the thought process was, well, we can test people for COVID, but if we don't ever change the background and the underlying factors of that population, we're never going to be able to withstand another pandemic or, for that matter, even improve long term health outcomes for the communities uh, that we serve. So we really started to pivot to this idea if we're going to go into neighborhoods and test you for COVID, 
uh, maybe we can draw blood and we can start to look at things like cholesterol and kidney disease and hemoglobin A1Cs for diabetes risk. Mm. You're getting social determinant information, but let's start measuring blood pressures from a standard basis. And then let's start to think about creative ways that we can implement care pathways for those folks. So we started developing programs with community health workers and pharmacists operating under collaborative practice agreements to actually deliver care for these individuals once we engage them, still in that sort of pandemic um, mindset, if you will, which is you can't get into your doctor's office, you, you can go to the ER, but who the heck wants to go to the ER in the middle of a, you know, a life-threatening pandemic for something right. like hypertension? So we needed an alternative model, and that's where this really started to blossom. And from there, we were able to garner support for this concept with big grants from the American Heart Association and the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, further supporting this concept of a distributed care model. We have mobile health units that have patient service reps, medical assistants, community health workers, and nurses or pharmacists, but not doctors. Mm -hmm. Because when you think about prevention-oriented things like measuring blood pressure and drawing blood work, I, I have no role in that. I, you know, a medical assistant can do the, the work. We can get the numbers and then figure out what to do next. But I don't need to be in the field per se to have mm -hmm. the most effect of the work. We think really stepping back and saying, team-based care with a physician working with multiple components to reach as many as possible. And that, that really is the ethos of what we're doing. That's so interesting. And I was going to ask you about your, your subsequent success in the last three years, but I think you've really outlined it nicely. And the fact that you're getting grants and, and, uh, and other funding opportunities speaks to that, I think, but I mean, I don't know if you wanted to say any more about that. Yeah, I think what's really cool that that's happened is not only have we gotten grants and we got CARES Act dollars, we actually have been working with the state legislature and the governor uh, and have gotten budget appropriations to continue to support. Oh, wow. So we've had millions of dollars that the state has pumped into this because we've started to conceptualize not just our work, but others started doing mobile health care, which is great. The more the merrier, right? Because there's a lot of problems out there. But how do we align this so people mm. aren't competing, but collaborating. We started working with the state and other funders like the Kellogg Foundation to develop something called the Michigan Mobile Health Corps, where we could use data to coordinate deployment of units across regions, across the entire state, and have this program that we can know where risk exists, target outreach, do that for the pandemic, for chronic cardiovascular risk, ultimately cancer, which I know we'll talk about, and then flex up if COVID has a resurgence, if we have a new pandemic, right? We were worried for monkeypox, you know, might, might uh, you know, do something. We started adding monkeypox testing uh, and vaccine, you know, uh, treatment uh, uh, prevention work, uh, you know, to this in a flex up approach. So that's wow. really the mindset. And then the other thing I'll leave, you know, at is that we've now got the payers on board. Mm. And so we have um, some businesses that we work with Blue Cross Blue Shield around bringing services to the place of business. We have uh, Medicaid managed care uh, um, agencies we work with who have patients who aren't going for usual prevention care. That's a lot of people. Uh, oftentimes, it's 30 to 40 percent of their covered lives. Mm. If we map those folks out within social vulnerability and health risk, we know where to target. And now we've worked with them on creating new billing codes. Uh, that allow us to go out there and do this in a sustainable manner. I mean, I love writing grants, but I don't want to do it the rest of my life. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you later, a little bit later about the, um, I know you're talking about like alternative payment model, like fits with different pay payment models and things like that. So uh, thank you for for that little foreshadowing there. That's that. It sounds amazing. Well, I thought, you know, maybe now would be a good time to turn to the mobile cancer screening component of that work you, you were just talking about. Um, so in a minute, we'll talk about the uh, the model you created for the kind of non-CT based screening that has evolved to include mobile CT units. Uh, but first, I'd like to kind of contextualize why you think uh, lung cancer, and again, you've you've kind of talked about this a little bit, but why you consider lung cancer to be such an important uh, uh, condition to screen for in the communities you serve, um, and and maybe you know I know I know you in Detroit again. You already talked about some some high uh, uh, rates of of disease, but uh, smoking seems to be one of those one of the highest uh, rates in the whole country, uh, especially with the black population. So can you please talk a little kind of kind of kind of build on that and describe a little more detail the need for that mobile uh, lung CT screening capability. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so foremost, as you as you, you know, alluded to, Detroit has one of the highest smoking rates. So whenever I do my cardiovascular studies, we report smoking rates amongst our population of 40 to 45%. And people are always astonished because that's, you know, double national averages, right? 
And when we look at data from our data amalgamation program, Phoenix, we see that across the city, there are communities where 45, 50% of people self-report smoking. Hmm. And we know in a black population and underserved communities, especially those who are eligible for uh, low dose lung CT screening, right? From a reimbursement perspective from insurance, don't get it. About 5% of eligible black and underserved you know, community populations uh, get screened. And so we're really trying to, to say with this model that we've developed of, of outreach, can we do more? We know that the, the single most important cause of death, the leading cause of death in Detroit is, is cardiovascular disease. And people in Detroit are dying at, you know, averages, average rates two and a half times, you know, the national average. But cancer is right there second. And mm-hmm. even though we have wonderful cancer centers in the city, you only get to the cancer center once you get screened and diagnosed. And so you have a lot of folks out there who are not getting diagnosed. And what we also see is that the time of diagnosis, it's more, or it's often much more advanced stage. And so these folks have higher mortality uh, rates because it's just too late for some of them. Right. And so what we're really trying to say is, can we leverage the model that we developed with mobile outreach, with an emphasis on cardiovascular disease and start to grow that conceptually? not doing it in the same units, not even part of the same program, right? But looking at alternative ways that we can build all of this up. And so in parallel structure to what I've developed through Wayne State, we've started developing, you know, another entity that can can go out and do this long CT screening uh, and and building up, you know, what resources are available uh, for that. And understanding, right, this is not about just, you know, blind community screening, right? And just saying anyone and everyone can come out and get, you know, a CT because we know that creates problems and a lot of incidental stuff that doesn't, you know, necessarily, you know, create problems or life-threatening situations, but instead really saying where are the high rates of smoking and not where's the highest prevalence of lung cancer, but where is the underdiagnosis occurring? Because when you look at incident rates that are reported, it may seem great to say there are lower incidence rates in the city of Detroit, but that's a lead bias. That's because we're not screening effectively, right? And so thinking about it that way, we kind of know where to go and starting to think about that is is um, the, the way we're trying to build out this this mobile screening effort. Yeah, I just love the uh, the the proactive nature of all this, and and uh, you know that's something I wanted to kind of talk about next, which is like I know you're eval- you're you know again like you've talked about, you're currently kind of evaluating ways to equip, which I find so interesting, uh, specialized vans with co- uh, compact mobile low-dose CT scanners uh, to screen for lung cancer. So obviously you've got the mobile uh, ability there. And you and and uh, I was just wondering if you could kind of please talk a little bit about kind of where you are in the process, um, when the project will roll out, and I guess how your team decided to, as I read, your team decided to turn to the private sector uh, for help with financing, uh, at least in part, these vans. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, clearly, because of my roles, and I'm a I'm a big time academic. This is what I do for a living, uh, and a you know population health uh, interventionalist, if you want to think of it that way. But in order to build out a program like this, you need capital. You need mm-hmm. something that people, uh, you know, that someone's going to want to invest around an idea, a dream, if you will, that doesn't come easily in academia, right? There's, they're not just dropping checks for, you know, millions of dollars left and right. So um, I have some partners, friends that I've worked with uh, in the early stages of the pandemic to develop different components of our mobile outreach program, some of the IT structure and whatnot, and had some conversations and convinced some of these partners to come together and say, can we develop an entity and have an investment in the resources and and the vehicles and the scanners so that we can go out and do this type of thing and then go find unique funding opportunities to provide this care free to the population. So this isn't about creating at least at this point, a bit an insurance billable pathway, right? We know that's challenging. We know that that can create some issues. What we're trying to actually do is get a pool of funding mm. from different partners can be pharma, can be philanthropy, can be whatever, right? And and pool those resources to then use that money to support our program of mobile outreach and doing it really from a a mindset of complete, uh, you know, it's it's not necessarily philanthropy, but but altruism, right? Mm, Honest and true altruism where we're saying we can provide a resource, we can use the private sector to accelerate the process because the capital exists and then we can go out there and, and launch this program, which we're going to start in Detroit in mid-December, actually. Mm. Uh, we have a couple of great clinical partners, some, some wonderful uh, church organizations, some wonderful community uh, you know, uh, health partners around all of this. But the idea being, you know, this is, this is really a way to say, uh, 
to a community that doesn't have regular access to this type of resource, you know what? Yes, you do. And we're going to bring it to you. And we're going to make this barrier free and as easy to access for you as possible. That's excellent. And as we're recording this in November, 2023, it sounds like you're getting to roll it. You're going to try to roll it out next month. So by the time people hear this episode, it may have already rolled out. So that's really exciting news. Um, So yeah, so you've actually touched on uh, a couple other things I was going to uh, ask you about. So I just, you know, maybe I'll just kind of, uh, uh, kind of move ahead and say, you know, I, I know that you you just talked about, um, you know, opening up access to healthcare for underserved communities by not charging a fee for a lot of this kind of thing. So I was wondering if you could talk about a little bit about that and and how you kind of see that playing out. And also, I know you're talking, about, uh, you're in the talks to, um, in terms of financing these efforts, you and your team are working on developing economic models for value-based reimbursement, which I know is kind of a still, even today, kind of a tricky uh, uh, thing to pull off in, in some cases. So I was wondering if you could kind of and talk about how you're anticipating, uh, you know, expanding the preventative healthcare efforts. And, and, but you're, it sounds like you're also kind of trying to build out the, the financing framework uh, ahead of that. So if you could talk a little bit about how that's working out. Yeah, I love the way it, it sounds so easy coming out of your mouth, Chris. No, it's so challenging. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> but but what, what I found actually is in the post-COVID, we're well, not really post-COVID, but in this evolution of healthcare, you know, 3.0 or healthcare next, right? We're seeing a willingness and an understanding from the payer community that something different has to exist because while a lot of healthcare providers, what have you, want to go back to the way it was before the pandemic. People don't want that. And it was never that good in the first place, right? We always had people who are dying way too young from risk factors that could have been modulated if there was earlier prevention, cancer obviously being one of them. And so what we're trying to envision, right, is multiple different partners, pharma, device manufacturers, what have you, they all have interest in, in you know, reaching the population, but we're not looking to come under a research umbrella per se. We want to deliver clinical care through support from these these multiple entities pooling funds so we can go out there and screen for high blood pressure and kidney disease and lung cancer or, you know, in some cases, long COVID, people who have persistent shortness of breath after COVID. We know that's a problem in a lot of communities, maybe up to 20, 25% of people who had COVID have some residual symptoms and it's hard for them to gain access to the next level of care that they might need or at least the peace of mind that they're seeking. I had COVID, I just don't feel right. Is something really wrong with me? Or is just, you know, just the normal course of recovery that I that I just have to adapt to. And if you if you know that there's not something serious, that mental fatigue that comes with worry, worry, worry every day can be alleviated. And that's an important thing to do. But really beyond that, it's it's to try to say, how can we think differently about about getting these resources to people? So from you know, from this perspective. Philanthropy, pharma, pooling resources, paying for this type of stuff. From another perspective, working with businesses to contract to come out and screen all of their eligible people, 50 and over with 20 pack years for cancer or coronary artery calcium, which is where we really want to go down the road. You know, if you look at the things that can have the most impact, CAC screening, lung cancer screening, huge impact upon uh, uh, superimposed upon the other risk factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, obesity that we know are so important that we can do without an imaging based uh, approach. And so what we've been able to do from the payer perspective is create bundles for prevention oriented screening where they'll pay a flat rate to, to our program to go out there and identify individuals in the communities in partnership with payers for people who are not getting prevention screening services. They know what they pay for. If they tell us who they haven't paid prevention screening services for, and when we map them out, we can target communities, deploy units and do this. And the goal for my end, you know, is to say, what else do we put in the bucket? Do we start to put in, you know, appropriate US prevention service task force recommended screenings like lung cancer 50 years and older and you know 20 plus pack years we all saw the american you know cancer society modify their recommendations and it's much more in line with what i think the radiology community has been seeking right but i'd, I'd say one of the other pieces we're very interested in uh is really trying to understand is it just smoking is that the only risk factor what about environmental right we have mm-hmm. things like incinerator in detroit that existed for many decades and you have people who live in the vicinity mile 2 miles from the the incinerator breathing in high concentrations of pm 2.5 every day 
Does that increase the risk of lung cancer independent of smoking? A absolutely, right? But those folks might not get scans. And so how do we start to think about not only scanning, you know, the folks who are at greatest risk, but starting to uh, uh, understand and maybe expand risk itself. And so one of the things that we're doing as part of our screening programs is everything is clinical from the, cat, the CT perspective. And then we're consenting people to contribute their data to a longitudinal registry that we can collect more and more information on what's going on and incorporate data from programs like Phoenix to say, okay, this is what's up, but what about the environmental uh, exposure in that community they came from? Because I don't know about you, but I hear every day about, you know, not maybe not every day, but, you know, more often than, than I think I, I anticipated about people who never smoked a day in their life who end up having lung cancer. Yep. We just, we just did a podcast with a, a person who never smoked a day in their life. They were, they have a master's degree, in fact, in, in uh, exercise, uh, you know, uh, discipline and uh, in healthcare and they got lung cancer, unfortunately. So, and their husband is actually a, 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 a doctor and it, and it just flew under their radar completely. So uh, I encourage that's uh, uh, um, Heidi Anda and Dr. Pierre Anda uh, is the, that's the, um, the last one we did. I encourage our watchers to go and, and listeners to go check out that episode. That's exactly what you're talking about played out with them, unfortunately in real life. So yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but thinking differently about this and starting to get the data to understand this, but potentially doing it in a way that doesn't force the model of what's going to get reimbursed and be able to look at things a little bit differently. Like I'm not saying everybody should get a CT scan at you know every age, right? We know who's at risk, but how do we start to rethink what that risk really means so that we can capture all of these folks young? Because if you're not a smoker, you're more likely to get it late stage because there's no reason to get screened beforehand. I would say the most important thing that we've done is oh. work with our community partners, mm -hmm. right? This doesn't happen without the community partners who are the trust agency in the neighborhoods we want to go to. All too often, community members are used to the healthcare system, you know, not exactly being there for them when they need it. You can go to the ER, yes, but hey, three months for, you know, primary care appointment is not really very helpful. So how do you get that trust agency? You work with community partners. We have over 250 community partners that we've worked with. And you know, our mobile outreach, we've done more than 4,000 events at this point, more than 91,000 people that uh, encounters uh, that we've had. And so the model is gaining that receptivity. And uh, I think exposure like this you know, from, from this type of podcast is, is really important to help grow the program. Well, thank you so much. And we're so gratified to have you today. And um, and I will I'll just end by saying for our viewers that, and we'll have to have you come back and, and expand on all this. It's, it's so fascinating. We really want to track your progress. But um, I also want to let our viewers know that if you have any ideas for future show topics, please let us know on Twitter at, at Radiology ACR handle and Twitter X. And use the hashtag, hashtag ACR Bulletin Podcast. And I also invite you to check out all of our past podcast episodes at Apple, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. And also be sure to subscribe to ACR's YouTube channel to see our latest up updates. And please do get, hit that like button if you found today's episode valuable. Thank you so much, Dr. Levy. And please do come back soon. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Chris. I'm always available for you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you to our listeners. This has been the ACR Bulletin Podcast. See you next time.